welcome to to all of you. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome you all wherever you are at this session of our AIT Tech and Policy Talks, AITPT. And for those of you who join us for the first time, uh, AITPT is an initiative of our Digital Law Center that has the mission to present and discuss cutting edge issues dealing with the multiple facets of AI tech and policy. Uh, we launched AITPT one year ago, and now it, today it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome two speakers, uh, starting by our dear friend and colleague, Professor Julien Cabet, who is uh, Associate Professor at both the University Libre de Bruxelles, ULB, as well as at the University de Liège, um, and who is also, quite importantly, uh, very close to the Digital Law Center because he's affiliated researcher uh, with our Digital Law Center. And Julien will make the presentation together with uh, Thomas Van Damme. Warm well, welcome to, to him uh, too, who is a deep learning researcher at ULB. And they will present and discuss their research project on which they're working and on which we, we hope that we shall all have a chance to work together in the future, uh, which is assessing IP similarities through technology a trademark exploration of challenges and avenues. And as we usually do for our AITPT session, uh, their presentation will be followed by comments uh, that shall be made by two distinguished commentators. And today it's a great pleasure and honor to welcome Professor Dev Ganji, who uh, teaches IP law at the University of Oxford, as well our ho home uh, expert, so to say, Professor Stéphane Marchand-Maillet, who is associated professor at the Department of Computer Science here at the University of Geneva, who will, uh, as you can expect, uh, offer a technological and, and AI perspective on the topic. And then we will open up the floor for discussion and interaction with our speakers and, and our commentators. Uh, please do note uh, that the session is recorded and that we will make it available online for those uh, of you, uh, for the people who have not been uh, in a position to attend the session today. Without further ado, let me now wish you all a very stimulating session of AITPT and give the floor to Julien for the presentation. Uh, thank you so much, Jacques, and uh, thank you to Anna and both of you for, for setting up this session. And uh, thank you a lot, uh, Professor Ganji and Professor Marchand Maillet, for accepting to comment on our presentation. So I will share my screen with you now. Uh, this will, I hope uh, you can all see what's, uh, what's uh, uh, going to be the, the, the content of our, of our topic. So uh, I have the pleasure to, to introduce you to an ongoing research project uh, I have with colleagues from uh, the engineering faculty and uh, that we entitled here uh, regarding this presentation, Assessing IP Similarity Through Technology, Trademark Exploration of Challenges and Avenues. So uh, I, I, I'll present this uh, that way, uh, sorry, uh, with this outline uh, regarding uh, an introduction on IP similarities and, and, and the resulting to technology, which is what uh, we're interested in and that we want to present. We will present this through giving you a few insights of uh, the exploratory research we, we started and the state of the art as technical uh, issues re regarding the, this, this technologies. Then I, I'll have a few words on the challenges and concerns and the avenues that we hope we can uh, um, have through this, uh, this, this research project. So um, for those of you who are lawyers uh, in the field of IP, you are probably, uh, uh, familiar with this issue of assessing IP similarity. So I'm here taking an example that I usually use uh, in my corporate law class. Um, and the question uh, raised before uh, Brelton Court was whether um, these two chairs were actually similar from a corporate law perspective uh, in order to uh, define uh, whether there was an infringement or not. So basically, the, the, the first court in first instance uh, decided that there were no similarities relevant from a corporate perspective, whereas uh, on appeal, the Brussels Court of Appeal decided exactly the opposite. So this is probably something you are really familiar with, these kind of differences between the outcomes regarding the similarities as to two IP subject matters. So 
this thing I just introduced with this example from copyright is actually something that you find in every feed of IP, every IP rights as, as a common feature, this issue of assessing similarities that will take place from a different point of view. Um, and we will focus a little bit here uh, on, on, on trademark as I introduced, and therefore uh, you were probably familiar with the likelihood of confusion test, which is to be assessed from the perspective of the average consumer. This issue of similarity is something which is common to all IP and which you will find at both the protection and infringement stages. Um, and as I introduced, this is a subjective assessment that has been criticized in the literature for that reason. Uh, this is a subjective assessment as well, because there are biases in the methodology that I used. There are no set tests, uh, um, not always at least set tests for assessing these type of similarities. And one of the things and that led us to discuss uh, and envisage this research project regarding the use of technology is that this issue of assessing similarities nowadays is actually occurring at scale because in the online context and typically online infringement, you have a lot of situations where you'd like to assess similarities in order to define whether there is an IP infringement and to facilitate the management of your rights. So, these solutions at scale are concerned with different types of assessment and for different purposes and uh, are uh, taken over by different types of uh, entities. Basically, you would have private companies offering these kind of uh, solutions uh, for monitoring and enforcement, for prior art and clearance search. And recently, this is something I will uh, focus on. Uh, you have public IP offices that have been starting relying on these types of technology to help them in registering uh, rights. You also have, and that's, I think, something important to be mentioned here, you got a regulator that has been somehow interested in, in, in promoting these kind of technologies, and in particular in the context of uh, content moderation by intermediaries. So you probably have been uh, familiar or heard of the discussion on Article 17 uh, from the, uh, of the, the Digital Single Market Directive, and maybe you are aware of the ongoing discussion regarding the limitation of safe harbor uh, on uh, the new uh, Digital Single Act, uh, um, Digital Services Act, sorry, proposal, where actually the idea of relying on these technology to similarities is promoted by the EU legislator. And at the court of justice level, we can see that in the recent case law, uh, we've been seeing somehow a, 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 a validation as a matter of principle of the use of these technology, even though uh, the features will be important in the assessment uh, in the eyes of uh, the, the, the court of justice, in particular in the light of the fundamental rights. I'll get back to this as well. Besides uh, this uh, um, promoting of these type of technologies, um, the EU uh, Commission in uh, one of its communication uh, emphasized that resorting to technology in particular, uh, looking at artificial intelligence might be a good way in order to improve the effectiveness of our IP systems. So in my opinion, these solutions uh, are here uh, to stay, these types of solution at scale. So. Uh, maybe uh, they would help fixing some of the subjectivity and biases we uh, already uh, um, stressed out in the literature regarding uh, the assessment of similarities. This is in this context, this is on the basis of this uh, question that we uh, propose this kind of uh, IPSAM research project, IPSAM going for intellectual property similarities assessment model. So this is a research project that we started a few months ago. It's uh, funded by ULB and it's an uh, interdisciplinary research project. So we are working uh, lawyers and engineers uh, together uh, in order to focus on these types of technologies that uh, are tools for assessing similarities. The focus on this project is 2D images. Why? Because this is something that you would find in common in all IP rights, even in patent, you'll find 2D images uh, in the, the documents. We focus on IP offices tools because, and I'm very grateful to uh, the Benelux office, uh, we could attract the support of the Benelux office for uh, uh, helping us uh, on, on, this, on this research project. And we focus on trademarks. Even though I, I'm, a, I'm a copyright law expert rather than trademark law, uh, we assume that trademark was a more um, um, 
appropriate environment for uh, studying these technologies because you have a lot of trademark, a lot of science. So from a quantitative aspect, this is probably a better environment to, to, to dig into these issues. And also you have a little bit more consistency in the way we, we, we assess similarities in the field of trademark, in particular compared to a copyright, for example, where you get a lot of differences between jurisdictions and between objects. So, in order to, to, to define what's, what's, what would be actually the, 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 the exact outline of this research project, we tried to carry out some exploratory researches. So we tested uh, IP offices tools, which are publicly available. And you might know, for those of you who are familiar with this uh, tool that nowadays, you can, instead of just typing the name of a trademark or the name of a trademark holder, we can, you can actually um, put as a query, uh, include and upload, uh, uh, an image uh, of a trademark. And we tested, therefore, uh, three uh, IP offices tools, uh, which are relevant in the Benelux context, obviously the Benelux one, uh, the EU IP one, so the eSearch plus one, and the WIPE one, the global brand database. Um, some of these uh, uh, public tools, publicly available tools, are actually powered by uh, private companies. Uh, and one has been developed in-house. Uh, it's the WIPE one. So I'd like to share with you some of the example of this uh, research we made. And just for you to know, basically, we were looking for Wally in the bunch of trademarks that would be offered through um, putting as a query uh, uh, another trademark. So the idea was to introduce uh, and to upload trademarks that have been considered as uh, giving rise to a likelihood of confusion according to the EU IPO. And we focused exclusively on figurative uh, um, EU trademark. So let me just show you a bunch of examples of what we've been seeing. So the basic test was always to therefore upload the contested sign and to look in the results if we would find out the earlier trademarks. So we uploaded the one on the right and looking for the one on the left. Here is the first example I, I can provide you. So you see the circle with, with the flat bar and you see the results uh, which are the first ones here from the Benelux office, which are quite looking alike, but we won't find the one we were looking for, the expected uh, sign that was being, that has been considered uh, giving rise to a likelihood of confusion. At the UIPO level, we also had a lot of, of different elements, uh, but once again, we couldn't find the one we were looking for. Similarly, uh, at the WIPO, uh, we could not find either the, the one we were looking for. So that's an example, but as you can see, this is a very simple trademark with a simple shape, and you can understand probably that you would not find this and that you would find other related trademarks that are looking alike as well. We then tried with another one, which is uh, here looking like an F, and we really were expecting it to, to, to pop up in, 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 in the results. So we introduced, once again, this contested sign and could find uh, different uh, results, but not the one we were looking for. So this F, uh, this F uh, which was the, the, the earlier sign, would not um, appear in the results from the Benelux office. And at the EUIP law, uh, level uh, neither, at least in the 1,000 first result, because we did not uh, scroll over uh, the whole uh, results, but it was not appearing in the, in the first mainly relevant results. And you can see here uh, that we have things that are much more uh, different uh, from, from the, 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 the contested sign than the one we were looking for, which was the earlier trademark. And similarly, at the WIPO level, we could not find either these kind of things. So we were assuming maybe these are things that are too, uh, too, too, too simple and there are too many uh, trademarks looking alike. So we started again with other ones. For example, with uh, this elephant and here, uh, surprisingly enough, we could find it quite easily uh, in the Benelux office. So um, we had these, uh, the relevant trademark, earlier trademark uh, popping up in the first results. Whereas at the EU IPO level, uh, we found a correct match at, uh, you are seeing, uh, the, the 649th uh, position, which 
is much further than the, the 10th position uh, at, the, at the Benelux office. And in, at the WIPO level, we couldn't find it uh, once again, at least in the one first thousand results. So maybe we were assuming this is once again related to the type of trademark. So we started uh, with like these kind of more elaborated trademarks with colors. And uh, here we could find it quite easily at the Benelux office, similarly at the EU IPO level. But in the WIPO, uh, only with this concept filter, we could find it a little bit further. The correct match was on the uh, 200 position, uh, more or less. So all these examples are showing you that you've got a lot of differences uh, and we wanted to try with the last, let's say, uh, most relevant uh, in the eyes of a human being uh, type of trademark, which are trademarks with reputation to see what we would have as a result. So we introduced this uh, trademark that was giving rise to a likelihood of confusion uh, with the April well-known trademark. And here at the Benox office, we could not find there. Um, at the EU IPO, we found a correct match, but it was like kind of far in the results because it was around the, five, uh, the 500 um, result position. And similarly, at the WIPO, uh, we could not find it either in the first results. It was also around the uh, 500th result. So all these examples, and we could multiply it, but it shows you uh, uh, the, the, the functioning of these systems, at least regarding the outputs. And the general assessment we can make is that we have very different outcomes with these different uh, uh, tools, which is kind of uh, weird. Uh, we can understand it, but still, uh, that's 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 the result of this research. We had a lot of noise. We have a lot of uh, elements that pop up that might be considered maybe as false positive because they are looking alike, but still they're absolutely not the one we're looking for. And conversely, we also have a lot of uh, reasons that are to be labeled or that would qualify as false negative because probably these results would not be considered as giving rise to likelihood of confusion. And we had surprising results and we, that we could not really understand. And the typical one, and that's an example I wanted to share, when we introduced the, the, the Apple uh, looking alike uh, trademark, uh, we found correct matches uh, regarding the Apple actual trademark in WIPO's tools. But what was very weird to us is that the first uh, good result that appeared uh, was actually this old Macintosh uh, trademark registered in Spain. And the best match we got, the first best match we got was the Apple trademark, but re registered in North Macedonia. You would assume probably to have it like registered in the US or uh, at the international uh, level or, or, or the EU IPO. No, no, it was the North Macedonian registration uh, of the Apple trademark. So it's, it's kind of uh, difficult to understand. So I was wondering why, how does that work? And this is why I, turned it to, to, to Thomas to maybe explain to me how does that work and if he could just give us some insights on the technical aspects of this kind of technology. Yes, thank you, Julia. Um, well, in order to understand these issues, we need to look at the underlying technology. So for the moment, the current state of the art in image analysis and trademark retrieval, which is the task at hand, is deep learning. Deep learning uses artificial neural networks to learn complex relationships uh, for example, in trademark retrieval, we want to find a feature vector that is a list of numbers representing trademark's content for each image. We use these uh, feature vectors to approximate the similarity between images. And we learn the complex relationship between image and feature vector using examples. That is the strength of deep learning. It's a very strong approach, but it, it requires uh, big and labeled data sets. It will, of course, reflect the data used for training the models. So if you have biases in the data, you will have biases in the applications. And it is a black box, so you have no insights of the inner workings, which can be a problem. So concerning the data specifically, the current standard in academia is uh, the METU data set by Thurston et al. in uh, 2017. It's uh, the best publicly available trademark data set. It has about 930,000 uh, logos. Uh, and it is uh, these logos are sorted in three categories, like text, figure, or both. Uh, while it's a good thing that a data set of this kind exists, we have concerns. 
Specifically, uh, the expert labelization of the test set, which is used for the evaluation of the, of the, the models, is not defined, neither uh, the expert nor his or her methodology. Also, the data set is provided by a Turkish private office. That raises questions about its validity for other countries and other potential biases in the data sets. So moving on to the models used um, in order to find the feature vectors. Well, bear in mind that we do not have pairs of image to feature vectors. So we need to find a proxy so that the model can ultimately learn the intrinsic information contained in the images. For that, there are two major approaches uh, to this problem. Uh, first of all, the knowledge transfer. Basically, you would use a model that is trained on another task and you would transfer it, meaning you would use it uh, on your task, hoping that uh, these tasks will relate. The other one is the weak learning. So in order to train uh, some sort of the, the models, you would use weak labels, for example, the Vienna codes, which are a very uh, high level definition of, uh, of an image. Both approaches seem wrong. Uh, because none of them include information about the legal aspect of the trademark similarity evaluation. Uh, for example, in Torsen et al. in uh, 2019, they propose uh, an off-the-shelf CNN, which is a, a specific type of uh, artificial neural network uh, specific for images, that is trained on natural images. By opposition, the trademarks are uh, artificial images, so uh, they are only hoping that it relates. Um, also, they uh, remove the text from the trademarks in order to increase, increase the performances, which seems odd because the, uh, the text is, is a very important aspect of the trademark. So all of that resumes to treating and then benchmarking a problem using engineering solutions and hoping that the, these solutions are applicable to the legal world, which seems very wishful thinking. So, as you understand, therefore, there are challenges and concerns regarding the use of these technologies. So these challenges, these concerns have been already started being in identified in the literature. So there are bias in the data. And let's go back to the introduction. You might have different assessment of the similarities uh, regarding one single object, one single case, uh, even in the case that has been already emphasized in the literature. You also have bias in the design and of these types of technology. And uh, typically, uh, this engineering framing of the uh, task is actually likely to give rise to uh, the finding of patterns which are valid, but not at all from a trademark law perspective. And one of the main issues with the use of these technologies, the biases in the use of these technologies. And I'm quoting here Claire Fob, who is the head of legal content uh, from Darts IP that has been providing the solution that is used at the Benelux office. And, and, and she stated uh, in a conference here in Geneva one year and a half ago that uh, she was not afraid of artificial intelligence. She was afraid of the critical thinking that would be abandoned by users of this type of technology. So these concerns are actually uh, very important as to be taken into consideration because the solutions at scale are here to stay. But the subjectivity and the biases in the data too, we can't change data that are used to uh, train these type of, of algorithm. We can probably uh, make these a little bit better, but still you would have biases uh, in any way. So what can we do? Can we fix the subjectivity and the biases in the design and the use of the algorithms? We don't know, but it is important to take into consideration the fact that you have biases in the design, this type of engineering framing or the lawyer framing uh, that we evidenced through uh, studying a little bit this metadata data set are kind of uh, example of this. And you will have biases in the use. These type of biases we already know like automation biases, which is relying on the research of the technology and also specific biases related to the assessment of IP similarities that have been already addressed in the literature as well. So all these biases combined uh, may lead to concern regarding a fair trial because in the end, at the end of the day, it's 
still up to the judge to define whether you have similarities which are relevant from an IP perspective. It's up to the judge in the very end to decide whether you have something that is protected by uh, IP and if you have an infringement on IP. So this idea that there are biases in the use of these algorithms may really lead to uh, concerns regarding uh, a fair trial. And also, uh, we might have concern regarding under and over enforcement uh, of IP under enforcement in the case these technologies do not perform well and actually fail to identify relevant similarities and over enforcement and that's related to the biases in the use and the case these technologies identify similarities which are not valid from an IP perspective but still that uh, nourish kind of automation biases that would lead to these kind of over enforcement and probably um, here these kind of issues might be framed into uh, a more uh, broader uh, frame which is the concept of fair balance that is developing nowadays at the call of justice uh, uh, level so what's the avenue we propose with this project. With this project, we propose as uh, academic engineers and lawyers to work together, to work together towards trying to actually build a system that would be low by design. We know that it's, it's wishful thinking maybe, but at least to try to see if it's possible to include in the design uh, and to safeguard public values which are associated with IP and also to try to make it more transparent. So this idea of explainable AI would not be here the explicability of the system because maybe that's elusive, but at least to understand how it works and to make it more transparent. Thanks to this project, we expect to contribute to the state of the art uh, simply because we would be using another data set that the METU that we identified as the data set, which is the current standard in academia. We have the possibility, thanks to the support of the Benelux office, to try and to train uh, on, on another data set, which is actually uh, coming from a public office. And we hope as well to uh, find uh, whether there are other assessment models that would perform better or differently. And the idea would be to combine computer vision and, and the data we could extract from cases. So thanks to this contribution to the state of the art, hopefully we could also contribute to uh, the IP regulation debate because Thanks to the system, we could make some kind of benchmarking to compare the outputs of the system uh, which are publicly available and the system that we would have been building. And this would help us going from this exploratory research uh, I suggested in, in the beginning and which uh, used as an example to a systematic analysis. And this IPSEM model would serve as a, an evaluation grid uh, for assessing and doing these kind of benchmarking. And in the end, depending on the results we would uh, achieve, we could probably infuse a critical analysis of the IP rules and the related technologies and hopefully uh, identify and maybe limit some of the biases in the design uh, and the use of these technologies. So this is a very fascinating uh, topic. There are a lot uh, of things that are going on now and that will probably be uh, up um, out there in, in, the, in, the, in the years to come. So um, I'm very happy uh, that we had the possibility to share with you the first insights of this uh, ongoing research project. Many thanks for your attention and many thanks to Professor Ganji Marchandvaillet for your comments and many thanks to all of you for your questions. And I apologize if we can't answer all of your questions. This is a fascinating topic, but it's still, uh, there is still a long way to go uh, for having a complete view on this. Thank you very much to Julien Cabet, uh, Thomas Vantam for uh, the presentation uh, as well as to uh, um, to um, the participant to that great project, uh, specifically Olivier Debert, uh, who is also with us uh, today. Um, as you will have seen and heard, um, Dev Ganji, who is one of our two commentators, has worked uh, quite intensively on that topic and has also published on that. So uh, it's a great pleasure for us to hear his thoughts and reaction to what has just been presented, Dev. Thank you. And, and let me begin by thanking Julien and Thomas for not only and, and Olivier for an amazing presentation, but also for just conceiving of this wonderful collaboration. It's provocative, it's exciting, uh, and it's a wonderful project. So I just want to begin with a, a very heartfelt congratulations. Um, 
And I have a number of thoughts which I'm going to try and organize into sort of a few questions. I, I think what really strikes anyone who's looked at this field is the remarkable progress that the deep learning technologies made. And I found Thomas' explanation of the neural networks and the feature vectors, you then through numbers, you try and identify image similarity. The learning in that field has been tremendous. And that ties into Julian's point about solutions at scale. We have all of these pressures to deliver solutions at scale. You've got in the trademark context, each year a rising number of trademarks. Um, you had over 11.5 million trademark applications in 2019, and there needs to be a, a technology to help us keep up with this high pressure sort of hose pipe and, and trademark applications at scale. I think just one point tangentially before I get into the trademark points, Julian had mentioned Article 17 of the DSM Directive and the push towards um, algorithmic filtering in the copyright context. And I think it's important to note that copyright law is beginning to swallow up design law in the EU. After cases like Coffermel, um, you're getting the door open to design. So just something for Julian to be aware of. I'm, I'm talking to practitioners. I'm seeing a lot more enforcement of design through copyright law. So the DSM filtering obligation may end up being a design filtering obligation too, through the unregistered sort of copyright element. You, you push designs into the copyright system. You enforce them online under Article 17. And copyright law swallows up a bit of design enforcement online uh, that way. So that's sort of something to be aware of. Uh, just one sort of starting observation on the at scale aspect of it. Uh, and Julian will be familiar with this, as will, uh, as will others like Jacques, who worked on, on this before. Those who've looked at the copyright enforcement at scale, so YouTube's content ID kind of system and, and things like that, there are a few problems which emerge from that process, and I've learned from my colleague Daniel Seng recently more about this. There's, there's the concern of error costs, and it's hard to measure the error costs because the data stays with the platforms. Um, so if trademark law is pushing out in this direction in the future, especially on the enforcement side of things, just getting a better sense of what the error costs are. And, and I think Julian was very honest in his presentation in terms of the limits of the technology. And, and I think that is something to sort of be aware of. The second sort of aspect to be aware of when you're scaling up is the difference between a registration context and the real world when it comes to infringement. And we all know, or many of us know, that the registration context is an artificial universe. It's a paper-based analysis of prior rights, where you look at sort of documents with prior goods and services, prior marks cleanly on a piece of paper or a virtual sort of registration, and you compare it to another piece of paper or another virtual registration form. So it's a, a more clean and formalistic sort of process. Whereas the real world is full of noise, it's got false positives. And I'm, I'm thinking of this because you're seeing this technology rolled out across social media and somebody talking about a fantastic deal on a secondhand product they've bought, which proudly bears the trademark, could flag up an infringement sort of uh, signal when it's actually a genuine product. And you see this in some of the eBay litigation, which is about secondary liability for platforms and whether they have sort of, uh, you know, accessory liability or not. And eBay's own experts couldn't determine whether some of the products on the platform which were unauthorized according to them, were gray market goods or whether they were secondhand products or some were clearly fakes. But there was this gray area in between where the technology in the infringement space couldn't quite determine it. And that's a much more noisy context. So the registration context is more sanitized and clean and formalistic. And in trying to apply the same uh, technology across to the infringement context, we just need to be aware of the more noisy sort of context that, that's sort of there. The third thing to sort of flag, which is why I'm interested in scaling up in this area, is I think of tort law and the insurance system. And most disputes about whether somebody has been careless in terms of crashing their car into somebody or it's a workplace accident. Many of the, most of these claims around the world are handled through insurance systems. And the insurance system has its own stylized model of what tort or delict law is like, and it works with this stylized model to handle hundreds and thousands of these claims at scale. So when we start rolling out trademark law at scale online through AI, we're going to have a stylized model of the original trademark law in order to roll it out at scale. And again, just to be aware of the difference in people who've looked at how in the insurance model works, it makes certain presumptions, it settles more easily, it does things differently from a real tort dispute 
we might start seeing that kind of divergence open up as we start doing trademark law at scale as well. It may start working like the insurance system. Um, so just to sort of uh, flag up some of those concerns when you scale up. Uh, the next thing I want to turn to is a very interesting starting observation of Julian's, which is um, subjectivity. Does the AI step in and help you resolve subjectivity and, and make decisions more consistent and predictable? And both Julian and Toma have been very honest about the black box nature of AI so that, you know, there may be limits to how much explanation the system can give in some of their final slides talk about transparency as well. But I think I have a more basic question, which they will immediately understand when, when I sort of phrase it this way. Is the AI trying to reach a more objective decision or is it trying to more closely replicate what a human being would do? Is it trying to more closely replicate what a human examiner would do? In which case we haven't escaped from subjectivity. We're just trying to get a more accurate sort of outcome, which is the same as what a human being would give you. And that's your target. Or is your target a more objective analysis? And these are two related, but quite different things. So just to be aware, and I'm seeing them nodding as I'm talking. So I'm hoping I'm not sort of talking complete nonsense and, and they're sort of getting the difference between the two. And, and the reason I'm saying this is because the human assessor, the examiner, the judge, the tribunal official, uh, the lawyer who's advising clients who's sitting there is working with a very artificial legal sort of version of the real world as well. So the um, the judge, for example, is not asking the question of whether real world consumers are going to be confused. The judge is, she's asking the question of whether a hypothetical, notional, abstract consumer is going to be confused. And that is sort of somewhere in between a technological objective assessment of similarity and an empirical real world assessment of whether consumers would be confused. This artificial legal determination, it sort of sits somewhere in the middle. It's trying to reach for what a real world consumer would think but it's working with an abstract hypothetical consumer construct. And that is sort of something to be aware of. What is the technology trying to replicate? An objective determination or a subjective one or something? And if it's sort of subjective, if it's what a real judge would do, then she herself is going to be working with an artificial consumer as well. So just, just to be aware of these questions, um, sort of keep them in mind. That leads on to what this technology is doing. And I really have just two more points to make and I'll wrap up. The people working with this technology, and we've talked to people from uh, Christoph uh, from WIPO, who's the head of their databases division, and Anke and I, I can see Anke is online as well. Uh, he was talking to us at a recent sort of conference and saying that the technology offers partial solutions. And this relates back to Claire Forbes sort of concerns about people stopping to think people's brains switching off. For example, the image matching technology will give you just one partial answer to the question in a very limited but helpful way to help you handle the problem of scale. It'll help you narrow down these similar images, but ultimately the likelihood of confusion test is three parts. There's similarity of images, similarity of goods and services, and what would a hypothetical consumer think about these similarities. So we shouldn't be pushed by the front end similarity of the images, even if the technology gets better, like the Apple examples, and it can find matches. Um, and just you know, visual and conceptual similarity driving the analysis would then take us down a misleading, misleading sort of path because it's possible to see two signs or to identify two signs as very, very similar, but it still wouldn't be infringing. And the examples come up from all of the examples in the slides that they've presented, or Daniel Seng gave an example where a number of different entities around the world have registered variations on the letter W as their trademark. And the reason registries have given lots of registrations around variations in the letter W is because it's this very simple building block trademark. And therefore I found their presentation very interesting on how the technology is not so great when it comes to simple signs, but it gets better as you move towards complex signs. It's because registries realize that you can't monopolize very simple signs and concepts. So little differences are enough for people to sort of separate and distinguish themselves and also have their trademarks coexist. So the test, the ultimate AI application of the test needs to factor in these normative dimensions as well. And when it comes to weighting, when it comes to weighting your, your factors, which is something that the AI technology is very sort of interested in doing, here you have to rely on the normative sort of aspects of the likelihood of confusion test. And to give you an example, when you're looking at a complex mark, are the words more important or are the images or pictures more important? And you know, how, how would a, a real life tribunal handle this? Do you give more weight to word similarity or image similarity? 
And the answer is not clear. I, I mean, there's variation within the, the sort of registries and boards of appeal and general court. And they say, well, generally words are more important, except, and then there are exceptions when pictures are more important in a composite mark. And factoring this, and I can see Thomas smiling at me and wondering why he's got into this area, because the moment you sort of mix up with lawyers, life gets horribly complicated. Uh, but but you, you see what I'm saying. There's a normativity to legal determinations. So it's not just visually objective, but law starts giving things different widths on the legal test side of things. And you need to then sort of bundle these in. So these are just my concluding observations. I think it's a wonderful project. I'm, I'm grateful to be invited and to see your research. I'd love to read things that you guys are publishing. And let me end by congratulating you again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dev, for these very thoughtful comments. Um, I think it's uh, actually it was also a comment I wanted to make to try to see uh, how you can integrate other uh, relevant factors in the trademark infringement analysis as to um, similarity of goods and, and services and uh, consumer confusion. And to me, uh, one underlying issue that we also have to face, at least from a Swiss trademark law perspective, is whether we consider these issues as issues of facts or, or issues of law. Um, if we say this is up to the courts and to the judge to decide, um, any, let's say, data-based uh, results will have less impact um, if, if we, by comparison to a situation in which we simply say this is something uh, which is to be established by the parties and perhaps uh, for which uh, evidence based, so to say, documents could be submitted and including AI based uh, documents. Anyway, um, I think it would be good also in the interest of time to um, give back the floor to um, Julien Thomas and also to Olivier if he wants for uh, perhaps quick reaction on, on selected aspects of what Dev Kanji just uh, indicating, and then we could turn to uh, our second commentator, uh, Stefan Marchand-Mayen. Julien, Thomas, any? I, I, I start because I don't want to put too much pressure on Thomas because mixing with lawyers makes things more complicated than ever. So um, uh, I, I thank you. I thank you a lot Dev, for all your comments. Uh, I, I think there, there some of these aspects add to the things I already thought of, and some are actually like emphasizing things which I did not necessarily have the time to, to stress out during the presentation. So the, the one thing I want to say is that uh, the, the, it, it's complicated, but we are trying to, to, to to make it simpler, the analysis to factor out actually some of the elements that we should factor in. So the idea is really to try to focus on similarities and the possibility for technologies to assess similarities and limiting as, as much as we can the other factors that should be relevant. So basically one of the idea, but it really depends. So that's, that's the problem. That's why we lawyers and, and, and engineers have to talk together. Um, typically, one of the ideas would be to limit, for example, the studies to, um, to trademarks that were found to be rising, uh, uh, giving rise to likelihood of confusion, but only on the basis of the similarity between the signs, because the goods would be identical. For example, because that's 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 one of the thing we know that you based on the on the on the, the case of the court of justice, so you the likelihood of confusion, as you said, is three part of the test, and 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 the greater extent in in the likelihood of, in the similarities between the science can be uh, compensated, but a lesser extent uh, in in this in in the goods and services. So these elements are obviously relevant. So the idea would be to narrow down the problem from a technical perspective is how much data do we have that would be uh, concerned with only a similarity of science and identity of goods, for example. So we don't know. So we have to you know, sort out in, in the system and the data we have in order to identify whether it's possible. Because if we can imagine this from a theoretical, theoretical perspective, that, but we, that we do not have enough data to train a, a deep learning system in order to actually provide reliable results, it, it, it's, it makes little sense. So these are all things we still have to figure out how to deal with. But the very idea is this, is try to limit uh, as much as we can to avoid these legal elements that should be weighed 
uh, in the system, and that would be probably complicated to include if we do not have enough data. So that, that's that's the general thing I, I, I wanted to I wanted to say, and and I. I I, I thank you as well for your comment on Article 17 regarding the design law and the fact that actually this kind of system is that was supposed to be thought for typical like literary and artistic works would end up actually be used for other purposes, typically the, in the field of design. So coming from a, a country where actually you have a lot of cumulative protection for design and, 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 and copyright, this is not... Uh, an issue that we see exactly the same way as uh, you would see it in, in in the UK or in Italy or in Portugal, where actually you had more differences between the two. So this is already something we are familiar with in the context of the case law in, in Belgium and in Benelux, generally speaking. But obviously, it shows that um, this use of technology uh, for one purpose is not necessarily uh, appropriate because it will actually spread over other contexts, which were not taken into consideration in the very beginning. And if you're thinking, because I'm talking from my copyright law perspective, but if you're thinking about copyright law and the similarities relevant in the field of copyright law, you have very little harmonization in the EU. And obviously, if you're a US-based company like Google providing a solution, uh, you are also familiar with a context, a legal context, which is completely different. So these things have to be taken into consideration. And this is more an IP regulation and a policy uh, aspect uh, of, of the discussion. But these things are, are really important. So maybe, and then I leave the floor to Thomas to answer your question then regarding the, the, the type of uh, the target uh, regarding more objectivity or replicable subjectivity. I can't answer now because the idea is really to make these kind of you know, fundamental research as to the functioning of these technologies and to see what we can do. Because the, the, the idea of this project is twofold. We might not have bad results because either we are showing that these technologies perform well and can give some kind of consistency uh, in, in, in the analysis. Then we, thanks to this technology, can have some kind of critical discourse and regarding on the way we actually uh, deal with trademark assessment. And therefore, this would infuse the, uh, the, the understanding of legal rules. Conversely, if we show that it does not work or that we can't understand how it works and so on, then we can have some results that would be interesting uh, in the discussion regarding IP regulation and the use of these technologies and the education we should have regarding the use of these technologies, once again referring to the, the comments by Claire Faub. So these, this is the idea. We don't know actually what's going to be the target because it's going to be depending on what these technologies are able to provide as results. And depending on the results, then we'll focus more on one or the other. So that's the basic idea. Uh, this, this is we are really at an early stage of this research. But uh, I, I was uh, to, to be honest, when we started this, um, and that I, I introduced this research project, there was nothing out there. And then uh, <laughs> I just discovered that three papers, uh, and amongst these papers, your fantastic paper, were issued in in the past month after we we when we just started. So so I just can't tell right now what we're gonna do. I'm just saying that. This is typical research, uh, uh, like scientific research results, even if it doesn't work, it gives you great results and that you can rely on for further researches. So Thomas, I don't know if you want to add anything, but- uh... Yes, ju just a few things. Well, first of all, uh, thanks a lot for your commentary, uh, Professor Genji, it was very, very interesting. Uh, just a few things concerning the subjectivity. Uh, well, does the AI solve it? Uh, not really, uh, as you said yourself, uh, the AI will copy the human behavior, uh, but it will do so in a sort of objective way that will not change in the future somehow. And um, I would say uh, it should be better than what we have currently because of now we have rules that are clearly not anchored in the legal aspects of the similarities. And I would say that adding the human subjectivity to the models might uh, help the the problems that we see in the in the current search engines so it's it's clearly not a perfect solution but i don't think anything can be perfect in in this kind of domain because of the because of the difficulty of the of the situation so so that's all
Thank you so much. Uh, I suggest that we shall now give the floor to Stéphane Marchand-Maillet uh, in order to react also to the presentation. So thank you. Thank you very much for, for the invitation in that forum. So I, I want to concur with uh, Dave Ganji on the, the, the brilliant presentation from Julien and Thomas. Uh, very interesting and um, and also very enlightening on in terms of the, the example that uh, that were given. Uh, so I, uh, in a way, I've been asked to to be a commentator and to be critic. So I'll be I'll be a bit uh, a bit uh, a bit uh, criti criticizing the. So first first of all, Devganji has gi have given a lot of uh, of uh, very valid and uh, sort of wide range of points so so i i think uh, i will i will rather focus on the on the technological aspect rather than you know uh, uh, some of the things on subjectivity have been said already so i, I won't insist so much on this so maybe in terms of a very engineering technological kind of uh, viewpoint uh, the probably the 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 all my comments will circle will revolve around the the idea of uh, defining the tasks basically um, so so the first point i want to make i mean there's two sort of uh, background points that i want to make the first maybe um sort of uh, uh, not not so precise background point i want to make is that trademark search Automated trademark search, trademark information retrieval, basically, has been there for, to me, ages. Because <clears throat> I think I joined the um, University of Geneva in 2000. And I think one of the first tasks I worked on as in the computer vision and retrieval lab uh, were actually on trademark search. And I even remember that we went on buying the Vinacode CDs with to understand how marks were, were registered in terms of their, their characteristics like this and try to work on this. And at the time already, all these challenges that you that you define were present in the sense the subjectivity, the you know, the the, the difficulty on uh, characterizing shapes, uh, the subtle, subtle kind of difference that were made. And in fact, we often it went back to whatever the 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 the, the actually copyright infringement i'm not a lawyer or or a judicial uh, a law person so I, I don't know the vocabulary but but already all these um, a, a lot of what you present were present in a way uh, in the discussion uh, uh, in fact uh, to 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 give you a pointer uh, uh, is this uh, cross language evaluation forum which went on i mean this is the most formalized probably uh, so i'm pl I placing the link uh, this this link i'm giving is more on patent search so it's very different but it's it's also on ip related search but at the time i know some edition of this cross language evaluation forum which is a sort of Technical scientific benchmark of um, uh, retrieval engines based on trade, on you know on image search were concerned with trademarks. So probably if you dig into this history, you will find some interesting prehistorical kind of uh, trademarks. So so this is to say that it's a, it's a new problem because deep learning and uh, the new AI as we as a sort of reshape the way we see a uh, computer vision system now, but that, uh, the, the problem is there since a long time. There's another aspect on the, on the technical point of view is the difference you would make between a Google search, I'm taking the, the very, very specific example, I mean, the very sort of broad example of Google search and trademark search. And in fact, up to the point that in my information retrieval course, I'm taking the patent search or the, the, the trademark search as example of a different search from that from what Google is, is doing. So Dev Genji was uh, talking about false negative and, uh, and, and, and in fact, the Google search, in a Google search, you're concerned with not having false positive. You want to place on the first page the relevant result that will satisfy your user. In a trademark search, you are very concerned, or the, the error cost, like uh, was saying uh, Dave Genji, is the false negative. Because in fact, if you, if you show, like you were showing in your examples, a number of very similar lookalike 
train marks, but you actually missed the, the, the exact one that were in, in the registration that, that exactly looks exactly like yours, just flipped or somehow deform a bit, but which would be the exact relevant one that would, um, that would make the, 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 the registration contestable, then you miss the point of your search. So in fact, false negative are very costly in the trademark search, whereas in general, information retrieval are more like shape to avoid false positive. So you don't want to have clutter in your first pages of a result, because anyway, you assume that in a Google search, for example, the user will never go beyond the first page. I mean, I'm asking here who, who went on looking at these little O's of the Google in a Google search. Nobody does that. I mean, rarely you do this. So, so this is, and this is a huge difference in the design of the retrieval system, even though you would have the right similarity at the in the first place, you need to install some kind of, of a retrieval system that will manage that, re that, that, uh, that similarity. And this, um, so a, a typical classical Lucene, which is the Apache package uh, of, uh, for retrieval will not work on trademark search. So, so, so these are two kind of, setups that make trademark search quite different and difficult. Uh, uh, saying that a number of uh, engineer researcher, engineering computer scientists have been already uh, uh, tried and, and, uh, and, uh, and failed on this. So basically in terms of the AI aspect on the, on the, uh, of, the, of the task, I think there's, there's really a, a, a clear definition of the problem to be given. Because in fact, to me, it is not a complete view of the problem to only focus on saying, I want visual similarity. Because in the very first page, so the, the rest of the presentation was a bit uh, asked on, on a different topic, but in the very first page of, of your presentation, you, you, you show that chair and the, and the uh, AI system will actually uh, miss completely the point of the usage of, the ch of this chair. It will provide you, it will be able to even get some, uh, some dynamics of the chair, whether it will stand, you, you have AI system, now you show them an object and it will say whether the object will fall if you leave it like this or whether it will, it will stay because they understand the, phys the laws of physics, but it's unable to, actually understand the, the, the usage of the chair. So if the subtlety is actually on the usage, not on the visual similarity, then your, your, your search system will actually uh, miss the point completely. So on trademark, search, on trademark search, you don't have this problem because there's no somehow usage, but usage you can transfer it to the interpretation of the, of, the, of, the, of the trademark. And in fact, the trademark, comes with some kind of a context also. So for example, the Apple trademark comes with a, a context, a history, an evolution that somehow maybe we all have in mind the old Apple logo and then uh, the new one and how it evolved. And, and, and uh, a, a human, because in fact, when you compare, when you design your system, you actually, your baseline is actually the human assessor in a way. You know, I mean, you, you want to do as good as the human assessor, maybe at scale, but at least as good as an army of human assessor, you would say. But this human assessor would have some kind of uh, emotional or, or subjective history in mind when assessing. And this, the AI system will not be able you, to capture it unless you give it some context. And in fact, to me, what one thing that should be envisaged is actually to look into retrieval system, not only just posting the picture, find me something similar, because this will be difficult for the system and this has been researched for a long time, but rather to post some kind of, a, and I'm, I cannot say how, but a context of that trademark uh, to, 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 to provide more information, more subjective information or more contextual information to assess the similarity with something else, which would be in fact itself registered with some kind of a context also. And I think the, the definition of the pure similarity task for trademark retrieval may not be the, the full story. In fact, it, 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 it requires more. But if you take this, just this similarity retrieval, then, you need to define a lot more than uh, just 
you know, it, look, it looks alike. What is the precision? You know, what is the recall? Uh, what, what, what place the, 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 the actual trademark comes, uh, comes uh, as a, in, the rank, in the ranking of the trademark? Because in fact, you need to have different uh, sort of evaluation measures for your trademark retrieval to assess its quality. For example, the diversity of your search. In, in many search that you, that you show, in fact, the first results are all exactly the same almost. This is useless in a, in, a, in a search system because in fact, it just says, okay, there's many instances like this, we don't care. So the system should also encompass the fact of having some diversity and see and try to, to illustrate all aspects of the, of the search of that trademark so that you could even interact with the system saying, okay, yeah, this is the, the route I want to take to search and I want to dig into that branch of the search and find me trademarks that look like this, even though they don't look like the first, the one in the first place. So diversity, which is um, a common subject in uh, information retrieval, is um, is uh, is a uh, is an important aspect. And a, a, and a very similar aspect, I think, you should also take into account. And you mention interpretability, explainable AI, but I understand you mention it in the way of making the system and um, explainable how it works you know technologically what uh, what type of technology it uses neural network or this this is very important but i think the first explainable ai you should set up is actually the fact that the system explains why it finds it finds that this trademark is relevant to your search you were talking about a surprise but in fact, this would not be a surprise if the, the system would actually be able to show you the parts of the of the, the, the parts of its focus. There's a big topic at the moment in AI, which is attention. So where is the system placing its attention? And just the fact of discovering where the system is placing its attention when retrieving trademarks would be a cue for you to say, okay, it retrieves that trademark because it finds that this little part is actually the same, the same, uh, um, the same in both. And, 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 and I think this explainable AI is a way to cater for the deficiency of the global similarity, but saying, okay, and then having some interactivity would actually help in removing subjectivity because you would be able to dig and to specify, to teach the system which is the view on the trademark that you that you want to have, and not just a sort of bare similarity that uh, that would look a lot. Uh, and uh, and in fact, to me, and th that's where I'm a bit more more maybe not pessimistic because, but more uh, controversial is that to me deep learning will not make a progress in, in trademark search, rather the opposite. Because in fact, trade, deep learning is, is some kind of a, a, big, a big machine. It's a, it's a you know, um, it, it, it scoops things with a, a very large scoop and forgets about the detail. And to me, trademark search is exactly about the details and the outlier. And in fact, it's kind of antinomic with what deep learning is able to do in terms of you know, smoothing out the distribution, the statistical distribution of your visual similarity and forgetting about the specific outliers and really fine details and, and things. So, so I think I would be very careful with, use, with the hope of, be, of using deep learning. I would, for example, deep learning could be a very interesting tool to learn Vinicode, um, uh, and at the time we 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 had tried not with uh, not at all with deep learning or neural nets, uh, but with some more classical uh, computer vision technique to have this translation between the trademark and its Vinicode encoding, because that to me is a very relevant tool because it's actually um, understood to be a sort of uh, inner working of the trademark registration application and management system. So, so using, using this intermediate step and then proposing this or, or, or doing the assessment based on, on that kind of thing could be a way forward rather than the sort of brute force image to feature, you know, bare feature vector and similarity search, you know, uh, Euclidean metric or whatever on this. 
this uh, I, I'm, 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 I'm sort of placing the challenge uh, to you saying that, you know, maybe that is a bit too much to ask to deep learning because of the incapability of um, uh, spotting the fine detail and uh, scooping too large uh, of it. Right, so I think uh, to me, really, the, the, my comments are really in what exactly you want to do, either pure similarity or contextual similarity or fine-grained similarity or, you know, whatever you... So you need to specify very, very clearly the task you want to resolve because there's no magic in, uh, in AI. And the, the, the more abstract the task is, the more data and subtlety you the machine will be faced with and will smooth out all the detail and sort of give you some kind of majority vote and uh, end up removing the, the the actual relevant matches okay so 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 again thanks for your your presentation i think it's a very rich set of uh, example and challenges and uh, the project is indeed very, very interesting. And I'm really looking forward to, to, to seeing your progress in this. And, um, and uh, it's very relevant to, to a, a number of, uh, of uh, topics that are, are dear to me. So, so I'm really interested. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Stefan. That was uh, highly relevant also from a legal perspective to uh, understand and hear perhaps once again that AI is not magic. We perhaps hope and rely and want to rely uh, perhaps excessively on what technology can do. Um, also a reference to Google, um, as some of you may know, I'm just sharing that on, on the chat. There's this already relatively old, at least in the digital age uh, paper, which was published by a colleague from Stanford Law School about the potential use of, uh, of Google for uh, trademark um, assessment and analysis. Um, uh, just one quick, very quick reaction also to try to think about what might come in the future, also coming to the first point that you made, Stefan, in terms of trying to see what shall be the scope uh, and perhaps a broad scope in terms of contextual analysis. Um, um, as we know, um, trademark law, not perhaps for that specific issue, but for other issues, uh, may rely extensively on surveys. Um, and, and so there is a massive amount of data which might be available and perhaps put to use. Um, and, uh, and, and this is not for discussion right now, but I think it would be interesting to see because um, that may also help perhaps to assess uh, to what extent there is a level of sophistication among the consumer. Is it like a specialized product for which perhaps you can expect a higher level of attention from the consumers or for the clients? Uh, there are obviously a lot of data, consumer related data uh, out there that might be put to use in a way or another if we adopt some kind of a broader uh, perspective. Um, now, um, in terms of discussion, I, I know um, that uh, unfortunately Dev Kanchi has to leave pretty soon in order to teach, um, which obviously has a priority. So perhaps uh, we can give you uh, the floor, Dev, if you have any reaction to what uh, Stefan just said, and then uh, of course give the floor to, to Julien and, and Thomas for reaction to what Stefan has just uh, put on the table. Dev? Just to say, I found Stefan's comments incredibly helpful and circling back to one of his main themes, defining the task behind the similarity assessment is, is something I've, I've really taken away from this. And Stefan, I'm apologizing in advance. I am going to pester you by email for further readings and more information because I think you pointed out things that I need to understand better. Uh, so just thank you very much. It was a pleasure. And thanks for your comments too. They were very enlightening too. So thank you. Thank you very much. So we'll certainly continue the discussion. Thank you so much, Dev, and, and we'll be in touch soon. Thank you. Uh, so back to Julien, Thomas, and perhaps also Olivier, um, if you want to react. We well, shall start. Uh, Thomas. Thank you. Uh, I, think, I think I will be more uh, to the point than, than Julien on this one, thankfully. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Prof. Marshall Maillet, for this very, very interesting comment. Uh, I, I will go uh, step by step in your comments so that uh, I don't lose my, my tracks. Uh, 
first of all, you raised the point that uh, there is a very uh, uh, big problem in this field that is the definition of the task. And you said it yourself very well, uh, precision recall, these kind of things that we normally use and are very happy with in, uh, in engineering uh, are very poor for this kind of, uh, of systems. Um, so I can only agree more. I, uh, if you have any idea as to uh, what we could use to, to better represent the task at hand, uh, I would be very happy to hear them. Um, concerning the, the fact that train mark retrieval is very old. Yes, of course. <laughs> I only mentioned the deep learning part because, well, first of all, uh, time, uh, time, time is, uh, is, of, uh, is, is rare. And uh, it, it is the current, I think, state of the art in uh, the public offices and uh, the private uh, 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 firms that are developing these kinds of engines. So I think it's more relevant to use them. Furthermore, I think uh, that the literature, like in, I think it's 2016, the literature in Turing March Retrieval uh, went from uh, classical machine learning and uh, other uh, other method, methods to deep learning. And I think it's a very, uh, very big problem because we, we saw before that, that the machine learning uh, aspects of similarity for train marks, were very much based on the similarity of uh, of uh, of the legal uh, perspective. Like uh, you would see uh, Gestalt principles modules being used and weighted, and it was way closer to the to the to the to the legal aspect. And I think deep learning went over, and because of the performances that we could see, uh, were more. Uh, how would I say it? Uh, they, they they took over and just became the silver, the silver bullet for this kind of things. And uh, no one asked the question before, or uh, can we go back to, uh, to, the, to where we were before in terms of uh, Gestalt principles uh, only to cite them. Um, let me, yeah, okay, uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yes, indeed, uh, you mentioned that uh, it's very complicated to estimate, to, to, to evaluate the similarity between marks uh, due in fact, to the, the exterior information, such as the context, the reputation, and so on. Uh, you mentioned uh, the physical laws uh, to, for as an example. Of course, uh, I think it's very hard. I think it's uh, very challenging to kind of input these kinds of informations into the systems. I don't think uh, this is uh, something we will be able to do in the very near future, at least. Uh, and I think it remains, uh, it will always remain some sort of very, very challenging task that uh, we do not have uh, a very defined uh, historics or context uh, for, we all have some sort of history and, and uh, comprehension of things that is very rich compared to what we can teach machines. So I think this will remain a, a challenge. Uh, yeah. Furthermore, for the the metric that you mentioned, yeah, clearly the the PR that we, that we just mentioned and diversity in clustering is very very interesting. I think. Uh, let me just know that uh, before that, before deep learning, <laughs> there was a, a subfield of train market retrieval that uh, used relevance feedback from the the humans. So maybe that is what you were referring to. I think it's uh, it's indeed a very nice application. And to jump on that, uh, the explainable AI that we mentioned, and I'm sorry for that, it probably wasn't clear enough, was indeed what you mentioned. So uh, transformers, attention, uh, class activation maps. And I believe it's very interesting for uh, practitioners. So for those of you who do not know what this is, basically uh, it involves uh, seeing what part of the images render what kind of results. So basically, you can see an image and see a heat map on the image and be like, okay, this is more, this kind is giving the, well, these patches in the image are giving uh, these kinds of results. So you know what are the parts that are considered infringing, for example. So you would be able to say, yeah, this, this, this is infringing, this is not, and furthermore, we'd find the model or at least understand what the model did uh, and not blindly believe it. So uh, clearly, I think relevance feedback, explainable AI, all of that can clearly be implemented into some uh, search engines in the future so that practitioners can better, uh, better refine the searches and hopefully at some point uh, uh, gain time and resources. Um, and then um, I, 
I'm not sure deep learning will not make a progress in trademark search, as you said. It's just, I believe it will, but it will need uh, human, we, we need to gain what, what was good before, before deep learning, the Gestalt principles, these kinds of evaluations, a different metric, certainly relevance feedback, explainable AI. And I think will that, we can leverage the power of deep learning and the black box effect to get a better grasp and better models, finally. So that finishes it for me. Um, if I, if I can you... just say a yeah. word. Yeah, sure. In fact, it's exactly this. Uh, uh, deep learning as a, as a function regressor, you know, you, you can learn any function with, uh, with this kind of, uh, of, um, of tool is it's not as a, as a big black box, it will not resolve the problem, but no. locally on learning Gestalt or whatever, uh, other very well defined small task, it can have, it's very powerful. So it it can have its really place on this. It, it's an improvement from the 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 the, the, the before used uh, regression techniques, but as a scoop, as a big scoop, it will it will not give a solid, provide a magic solution to the problem. It will just be find its place on the still uh, need to have a fine grained definition of the task. Clearly, I couldn't agree more. Okay. Um, Olivier, maybe you want to say a few words? Yes, actually, I totally agree also. And this is the, the nice uh, thing of this problem. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problem where a simple end-to-end -end, uh, learning will not uh, be sufficient. And so clearly, we have to put some more intelligence uh, in, the, in the solution. And this is what makes the problem interesting. It's my point of view, at least. Uh, but uh, yeah, I agree totally on, on the, all, all the remarks that have been uh, raised uh, uh, so far. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Julien. Yeah, if I may, just on, on this last thing, uh, precisely that's, that's, that's the uh, issue of working together, lawyers and, and, and engineers, to define what's the, what's the, the accurate, the precise task uh, we want the, the, the machine learning uh, to perform. And, and, and definitely that's complicated because, you know, I've been reading these kind of uh, technical papers in order to understand uh, as much as I, uh, as I could. And, and, and Thomas uh, has been making drawings uh, on the blackboard in order to explain to me what he was actually doing. So this discussion is interesting. And, and the very relevance of our project is basically that I don't know what's going on in private companies because we do not have access to the data. But if we look at what's in the literature, we are seeing that there are problems in the task that is uh, uh, performed or given to the machine by engineers because it does not include uh, these ideas of what is relevant from a legal perspective and what would be the precise similarity task you would like uh, the machine to perform. So that, that's, that's the great thing. And that's still what we have to do. But there is this connection between the legal uh, relevance, the, um, the, the, poss the technical possibilities, and the data we do have access to because all these three elements are intertwined in order to have something that might provide relevant results. So that, that's, about, that's about the last thing uh, you were saying. And I, I was just like, pick two things um, that, that you mentioned as well and that are interesting. So one of the ID of this project is also to include the assessment of similarities from an IP perspective. We're focusing on trademark, but basically why I showed you the trip trap chair uh, as the first example is because this is typically the kind of object that can be protected by every IP rights. Mm -hmm. So this project, this, this object has been litigated all over Europe uh, from a, 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 a copyright and design perspective and now also from a trademark perspective going up to the court of justice. And before there was a patent on this chair. So this is typically the kind of object where you can just address the similarities uh, different ways depending on the IP. So the idea of including the use of this chair in the as the complex task that would be uh, addressed by by the deep learning process is also something that might be uh, a future. But we won't go that far with this project because we will focus on on more precise tasks because it's already complicated. But that's 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 the great like faith of these kind of research is that we could maybe go beyond uh, these small tasks to 
try to see if we can make different systems, um, including different types of similarity assessments, relying on, on the different uh, IP rules. And another thing I wanted to say, because I found that fascinating, what you just pointed out regarding the difference between the Google search and the trademark retrieval search regarding the what you're looking for, false positives or false negatives. The tricky thing is that IP lawyers, maybe lawyers are somehow messed up, but we try to use Google in order to identify false negative. I'm mentioning here, so uh, Jacques uh, referred to this Google uh, uh, short code to trademark law, which is a very fascinating paper, but where Google trademark search is actually used in order to identify whether a trademark has a reputation. Basically, if you got this trademark popping up in, amongst the first results uh, by Google, it means that Actually, this, Google, this, this trademark is relevant to, to the public and, and maybe as a reputation. That's, that's the basic idea of this, this, this project. I've been focusing on another use of uh, Google search by, by, by practitioners, which is typically the idea of actually um, putting as a query uh, the copyrighted work. Uh, you want to uh, address uh, its originality. So typically, in particular in my country, the uh, prior art is used in uh, litigation in order to uh, denigrate or to, to actually contest the originality of the work. And the basic trick and the basic tool that you would use is actually Google image search, because that way you can identify uh, other related works that you would put before uh, the judge in order to, 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 to litigate and to contest the originality uh, of the work. So actually, that's, that's, that's one use that can be made as well by IP lawyers, IP practitioners of this type of technology. So that's I, this idea of like focusing on false positive or false negative is very interesting because it will help us also mapping the way we should address this not from a technical perspective, but from an IP regulation perspective. So these kind of insights are very helpful for, for this project and uh, will also once again help us uh, focusing on, on, on the right task because it's not only deep learning that uh, we oh, need sure. to find the right tasks also for us as human beings trying to, to do some research in that field. Yeah, Retrieval has a, has a big role in that. And I pasted in the, in the, in the chat uh, the link to TinEye, this uh, reverse image search that you may, you, you may know, uh, which may be relevant to your project also. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. We have a few minutes left um, and wanted to open the floor for uh, comments and, and questions. I invite. I am sorry uh, at that stage, I, I will have to go. I'm teaching too, so I, so, I, I will have to go. Thank you but, so much, Stefan. So I thank you quickly uh, so much and, uh, and I, I, le I leave you there. Thank and you, we'll, have a nice end of the meeting. Thank you. And we'll be in touch soon. Thank you so much, Stefan. Thank you. So are there any comments or questions from the audience, I would invite the people um, taking the floor to please briefly introduce themselves before uh, making the hopefully short statement in the interest of time. So I see the hands up by Raoul Bartia from EU IPO. Raoul, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. And thank you all the presenters and commenters. Very interesting. I think even uh, as a part of EYPO, I'm responsible for AI implementation at the office. And it was very interesting to see that you evaluated. I agree personally with your assessment, so it's, I will not defend the message we have. It has its problems. My question to you is um, regarding what metric, because you will come up with a new image search, let's say you are building on it. If we cannot judge, a new system just based on two, three opposition image similarity or hundred even. So what metric you are thinking you would use to compare two systems? Because this is one of, and as you see, opposition is very subjective. It has three elements and it could have another elements. That's why it was opposed. So what metric you think you would be using or you have thought about it, even also for you to, to see uh, this mod, this version is better than the before or the next. So this is the only question I have. Thank you. Thomas. Yeah. Thank you for your comment. Um, well, 
I would say the metric itself is a problem, but I don't think we have a much better solution at the moment. Still, I would say that the current evaluation data sets are very much the problem because you look at them, and as I said to you in the Metu data set that you probably know, the similarity evaluation is very vague. Uh, we have no idea as to how it was made and what are the principles behind it. I think we need to anchor ourselves into the reality, into like, for example, cold decisions. I think th this would be the first step to do in order to have uh, at least an evaluation that reflects the, the field reality. Okay, thank you. That's, thank you. Any other comments or reactions from the audience? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, Lonica, yes. please. Hi, so uh, yeah, my name is Lonica van der Plaas. I just uh, started at the uh, EDAP Research Institute. Uh, I'm not in uh, vision, I'm more in language, but I still uh, I find it very interesting topic and I have actually two uh, questions or comments for you. So um, one thing I, which I find very interesting is all, in all the discussions that we had now was about the specific task that you're actually uh, focusing on. And one thing that struck me, and um, while you were talking a lot about similarity, you were also talking about the likelihood of confusion. And I found that concept very interesting. So I'm, I'm not really sure what do you do with that in, 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 in law, but uh, for me, um, when I look at it from a technological uh, perspective, I think that most systems aren't, are, are really looking at similarity more than this likelihood of confusion. And I think it's something that we should really uh, tear apart in a way, because uh, when you look at systems and how they calculate similarity, that's not always similar to the, you can't really say that the similar something is, the more likely confusion for humans will be. For example, there's uh, some evidence from systems where um, p uh, systems get confused in situations where humans are not confused at all. For example, if you have traffic signs, yeah, if you look at the uh, being able to identify the traffic sign, if you put a little sticker over it, uh, a system will get very confused, whereas a human wouldn't be confused. So these are very interesting uh, situations. So. I was wondering whether you have a data set, since the, you, you do all this uh, research and there's so many people working on this likelihood of confusion where, where this is used to say, yes, uh, here there's a problem or there isn't, right? Would there be a data set in which you, ha you have this kind of labels where you say, okay, in this case, there is indeed a high likelihood of confusion and here there isn't. That would be so great uh, to be able to use that for, uh, for your systems, to train your systems on, because in, in fact, it's I, I get a feeling that this is actually what you are uh, aiming for. So that was one of my comments and questions. Maybe you have a reaction. Maybe maybe I I I answer this question. So it's it's a, it's a very good question. And um, from a legal perspective, just to mention, actually the the relevant criteria would be likelihood of confusion because this is what you are looking for. This is the infringement and and like uh, mm -hmm. uh, regis registration. Uh, relevant test. Uh, and as Dev Ganji said, it's a little bit different between the context of registration and the context, context of infringement, but still this is the idea of looking for the likelihood of confusion. So the similarity assessment of the science is only one part of the test. And therefore, uh, obviously, if you have similarity of science, you don't necessarily have likelihood of confusion, but one of the issue is whether we can narrow down and depending on the data we have, um, to actually focus on situations where um, the most important aspects and is similarity of science, which is akin almost to likelihood of confusion, because there would be identity of goods, which is another like similarity and identity of goods and services, is another element of the test. So we're trying to find out whether we can just focus on simple tests to have something which is not the same thing, similarity and likelihood of confusion, but at least a proxy. So the closer one we can get similarity of science to likelihood of confusion. And regarding the data, um, yeah. there is this great thing, which is uh, uh, the, 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 the IP offices where you have actually boards of appeal and, and examination division and opposition divisions uh, um, uh, giving their assessment of the likelihood of confusion between two signs. So That's the so idea, great. this is exactly the example we gave, actually they are coming from straight 
straight oh, okay. from right. these, these decisions, actually. So the, the examples we gave are not things we are assessing as giving rise to like the, the, of confusion. Mm -hmm. These are EU, IPO, opposition divisions that have been stating that these things were actually giving rise to like the, the confusion. So that would be the relevant data set for um, testing our system and for giving feedback to the system uh, when needed. So we would once again, depending on the numbers of that data and the quality of the data, but the great thing is that the EOIP is doing a very great job in like formatting this, this, these decisions in, in some, some kind of um, uh, workable way. Uh, so maybe it would be a great uh, uh, data set to use in order to actually infuse our system with rules that would be more relevant to the legal uh, uh, system than the metrics that would be purely uh, mathematical and, and kind of uh, um, used in the, in the engineering environment, if, if I may say so. so yeah. I, I hope to answer your question. But yeah. yeah, definitely, yes. So, yeah, that is such an interesting data set then, because I think uh, the data sets that we're using right now are not focused on, on this confusion aspect. They're more focused on, would you put the same label on this? Like, is this a dog and is this a dog, right? And this, this, uh, these subtle differences that you get with confusion are so so interesting. So it's, it's a kind of a different type of similarity, I would say. And it would be very nice to see if the systems that we develop that do well on similarity as we define it, also do well on this uh, likelihood of confusion. Uh, so the one last thing, I just uh, do a small comment. When you talked about uh, this chair, which had a diff where the function was important, right? I was wondering, since I'm working on text, I'm very interested in text, would it be a good idea to have a system which is not only looking at vision, but also uh, also at uh, the text around it? Because the text will have much more clues about uh, what things are used for and what is specific about the invention. Is there also textual, uh, textual data in uh, these data sets uh, or is it more visual? Julien, if I may. Um... Thank you for your comment. It's very interesting. And actually, it's one of the, um, the areas that we want to research in. Uh, first of all, the, the decisions that Julia mentioned are uh, motivated. So there is a sort of explanation of the, the origin of the decision. And I hope that at some point we can get uh, that as it and extract the information from it and link it with the images. That would be, that would be the, gold, the gold bullet, I, I think. Furthermore, concerning the the link between text and images, uh, uh, I can't agree more. It's, I think they are complementary. And if we, if we can achieve to link the text with the images and, as, and, uh, and, and find, uh, if you will, the, the, the intrinsic information that links themselves, I think it, will, it, would, be, it would be great. Furthermore, uh, we, uh, con in, in all research uh, aspect, we just did a, um, <clears throat> We just uh, gave a uh, funding uh, a request concerning uh, the same kind of, of things in patents. So we, we would like to do uh, the link between patent text, which is mm -hmm. more well, what you what you described, with the uh, with the uh, the technical inventions themselves and uh, and the technical uh, uh, drawings. And I think this is more what uh, what we are going forward to. Great. Yeah, that's, uh, that's very nice to hear. Thank you. Um, I see there's another hand uh, up, uh, which is uh, the one of our friend and colleague from EIPO, Philip von Kapp. Philip. Thank you very much. Very interesting debate. I wonder when I can retire because all the artificial, artificial intelligence will do my job. I'm looking forward to this moment. I'm one of those who take decisions in boards of appeal on the EOIPO level as a member of the boards of appeal. And I, I'm now doing that for the last 20 years. And <clears throat> I still do not always foresee how my colleagues will see in the three composition, the, <clears throat> the likelihood of confusion. We strive to be coherent. We strive to work on, 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 on uh, methodology as well, but it's sometimes really difficult and it might just Break it. I often think of why do my colleagues see a likelihood of confusion when I don't see any likelihood of confusion and so on. And I wonder think sometimes if it's a kind of political question, political conviction everybody has, like is trademark law more consumer protection law? Do we talk in the area of likelihood of confusion of consumer protection or do we talk more about 
competition law about the distance two companies need to have in order to coexist on the marketplace or on similar marketplace, which is as well more difficult because of as well we need to have the similarity of the goods. And we all know that the indication of the goods is sometimes very vague and we don't really, and many people apply for goods which they will never use and they have no intention to use. So it's, it's a very complex exercise we have to deal with. Maybe just to uh, as well tell you an anecdote. Uh, some 10 years ago in the office, we experiment, we thought to be more coherent, maybe it's better to have statistical decisions, statistics, uh, decisions based on statistics than on the individual uh, opinion of a rapporteur. And they had a kind of, the idea was to have a pool of 500 people inside and outside of the office who all know about trademark law. They know more or less the, the, the concepts. And then they would vote whether in fact the trademarks are similar or not similar with respect to certain markets, obviously, or without because it's difficult no? to ask, is this similar or not similar without knowing the goods and services that are actually involved in the marketplace. And um, I took participate in a pilot project not 500, but we had something like 40 experts within the office and outside the office, I think 40, 50. And then we voted like mm, every five seconds a new trademark and they voted, yes, similar, no, not similar. And then we had the result how the others voted. And it was very, very surprising for me sometimes. Sometimes I was with the 80%, sometimes I was with the 20%, sometimes it was like 50, 50. And this um, statistical experience as well, was very, very, very interesting for me because in the end, what we need to do and the concept of like the of confusion somehow as well um, applies some normative um, uh, uh, um, things, no ideas. We need to take into consideration that we talk about like the of confusion, which is as is the objective to think whether the consumer will eventually think that it comes from another company. And um, there's some normative issues like already in the definition of the relevant consumer. It's not too attentive, it's not very attentive, it's reasonably attentive. And this obviously makes the exercise for the informaticians even more complicated to I try to imitate this um, um, complex exercise. But obviously as well for us, this could be maybe a good tool to have a tool in which first parties could already check beforehand whether in fact there is a 80%, 50%, 60% of probability that there will be likelihood of confusion, then they can take the risk or not, and they take their decision. And maybe this such type, type of tool could be as well going in for us in order to be as coherent as possible with the more objective factual part of the similarity examination. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Philip. Um, any reaction from Julien? Yeah, yeah. I, I think. Sorry, sorry, Jack. Um, I thank you very, very much for for your comment, and that, that's that's really uh, what what we. I mean, as an IP lawyer, I've been studying the case law for years, and this is what I assume. It's a super complicated task to identify whether two things are similar in IP relevant manner, and probably it's not only an issue of similarities, it's also an issue of uh, normative assessment and uh, whether you'd like to protect more the consumer or protect more the competition uh, would give rise to different assessment as to the likelihood of confusion in the field of trademark. So that's one of the reasons why I would like to focus as much as we can on similarity. And uh, because that would be at least uh, being one element uh, that we could assume is a little bit less related to uh, the final decision, including these normative aspects, because uh, you can find similarities and still do not uh, conclude uh, to a likelihood of confusion. So the question is, can we find some kind of correlation and patterns as to the assessment of similarities that would help actually giving some kind of, 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 uh, of um, more not objectivity, but uh, more and more replicability of, of the assessment. So that would probably be the idea. And once again, this is this is kind of a general disclaimer, but that's why we think this is a 
actual scientific research project rather than like uh, practical solutions that we will bring. It's if that does not work, um, it shows also, it gives us insights on how we should use and what uh, uh, weight we should give to the results of these technologies, because I, I think they are helpful. And as I said, they are all there and probably we won't get rid of it. But even though we are aware of the limits of these technologies, there are psychological and cognitive psychological insights that show that there are biases related to the use of these technologies. So showing that it works or showing that it doesn't work or showing that it works in that particular context or it does not in another one is actually very relevant for um, educating the users of these technologies. So th that's that's something I, I, I guess uh, uh, that we could expect from this research project. And uh, we do not think that this task uh, of assessing the similarities, including the normative aspects in the field of IP should be left to the technologies. And uh, it, there will be always a human being involved as long as we're taking into consideration the assessment of a human being, being a judge or an examiner, um, and um, that would rely on a on a fictive character of another human being, being the average consumer, the intended audience, uh, the, the, the ordinary observer, depending uh, on, on the, the field of IP. So that's only a way to address how does these things work and what weight can we give uh, to the results of these tools and potentially can we help making these tools working better somehow. So that's that's the whole, the whole process. We do not think uh, they can perform your task at some point. You will be always uh, very needed for performing, performing these kind of uh, analysis. So, but thank you, th thanks a lot for, for sharing your anecdote as well. And uh, that's uh, it's pretty enlightening. Thelma, did you want to react? Yeah, just I would like to, just to add a thing about that. Just actually, I don't think it's ever uh, uh, possible to remove completely the human. For a simple reason is that algorithm can be played. You know, we can have adversarial attacks, as uh, uh, Lonica said. It's just uh, at the end of the day, we need the human evaluation to be sure that it's uh, uh, that it's what we think it is. Thank, thank you. I think there's, um, because we have to wrap up, there's a question which was uh, put on the chat uh, um, by Vilte Christine at this cells. I'm not sure whether this is the right pronunciation about the need to make a difference between the types of consumers, um, um, whether that shall be taken into account. Why, if I quote, assessing the likelihood of confusion, average consumer as we know it versus artificially intelligent consumer in AI assisted purchases. Um, I don't know whether anyone has a thought on, on that. Um, yeah, I have a thought, I have a thought because it's something I'm really thinking about as well. Um, I mean, the case law is that we, uh, we, we need to reject an application if there is a likelihood of confusion, at least in part of the public. We don't need that the whole public that all average consumers need to confuse but if we have one part of the consumer who is maybe who has different um, behaviors than others and like different who's more attentive because he's a doctor and he knows certain terminology so understands the trademark a different way maybe as well the same will come with assisted purchases um, i understand however as well from the recent uh, conference in which i assisted was that um in fact, maybe we don't need trademarks in the area of uh, artificially intelligent uh, purchases anymore because they will look for other um, um, characteristics of the products rather than trademarks. And uh, then maybe for those, um, the likelihood of confusion will not be important as well, at all because trademarks is secondary importance, no? Because they want to have, uh, I don't know, um, a trouser which is warm and uh, has a good design of a certain type and the trademark is not important for him so maybe being assisted that this trouser fits to him doesn't is not important for him to have a trademark anymore so the whole commerce obviously would change as well and then obviously we should reflect it in our practice as well 
So perhaps this is the end of trademark law and the death of trademark law. The last word, and because we have to wrap up to Julien, Thomas. I'll just say one last thing, maybe that this is a good way to wrap up actually, and to, to conclude on these on these talk is that uh, the, the, the point of view of a human being is involved even though it's a fictive character uh, in all IP rights. So the race of artificial intelligence, we are looking at it for the purpose of assisting similarities, but it might be, and this is related to the question, uh, another question is, shall we still need to include this type of subjective assessment from point of view of the person skilled in the art or the average consumer or the ordinary observer and so on in the definition of the similarity is relevant to the different IP rights. It has been always assessed that way. It's like back in the old times, uh, a general concept uh, of IP um, um, infringement assessment, but is it still valid? Shall we take into consideration, and similarly in the field of patent, um, the, the person skilled in the art that has access to AI or that has not access to AI? So all these things are actually opening a new type of questions and a new research area is, shall we get rid of this uh, uh, average Joe that is included in the assessment of the different similarities between IP? Uh, so I don't know, but probably this is also something we should think of and that's underlying the question whether we can then make this uh, functioning in, 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 a, in a deep learning system as the one we are trying to build in the context of this research project. Thank you so much. Um, this has been a really fascinating uh, discussion. Um, will we move towards uh, AI-powered consumer in the future? That's, of course, open for debate. But this is really the essence of AITPT, uh, that we engage in, in, in two discussions for which there is no uh, solution yet and uh, about which we may continue to discuss in the future and that's exactly what we want to do also on that specific topic so many thanks again to our speakers many thanks to our commentators who uh, had to leave in order to teach uh, uh, a few minutes ago and many thanks to all of you for your participation to this session we very much look forward to seeing you at the next session and last but not least also all our thanks all my personal thanks also to Anna Andreevich uh, with whom I've been organizing these sessions since uh, the first session last year so many thanks to you uh, wishing you all a, a very uh, good rest of, of the day and um, for the speakers and perhaps Lonike, if you want to stay, if you have a few minutes left, and Philippe von Kapp, if you also want to join us in the private room, you're most welcome to do so. And Olivier Debert, of course, you're also welcome to, to join us um, um, in, the, in the separate breakout room. Uh, and for uh, the rest of you, many thanks for your attention and looking forward to uh, future interactions. Thank you. <laughs>